Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us this evening and to a yet another packed house here at the American Academy in Berlin. I'm Gail Hodges Burt. I am the chairman of the Board of Trustees of the American Academy, and I'm happy to welcome you all here tonight. Um, to hear Sir David Chipperfield, who we're very excited uh, to have uh, be our speaker tonight. Uh, we are joined tonight by his wife, Evelyn Stern. And Evelyn, thank you for, for coming with us. Yes. Uh, my fellow trustees, Wolfgang Ischinger and Regine Leibinger, are here tonight. Our senior counselor, Bernhard von der Planitz, who makes everything happen here on time and correctly, is here with us tonight. Um, and, of course, yesterday's distinguished visitor, Daniel Weiss, who is the president and CEO of the Metropolitan Museum in New York, gave a fabulous lecture last night. If for any of you that missed it, you can go online to our website and, uh, and look at it there. It's w well worth your time. <clears throat> um, I am standing here tonight by accident, um, mainly because our fellow trustee Marina Kellen French met with an accident on Monday and is hospitalized and could not be here. Uh, and the reason Daniel Weiss and Sir David Chipperfield are here is because of Marina Kellen French. Uh, so she was very disappointed that she couldn't be here tonight to uh, introduce David Chipperfield, so uh, I have the pleasure of reading her remarks uh, that she painstakingly worked on uh, to introduce David. So if you don't mind, I will start with her remarks. Um, she says, it is always a pleasure for me to be back in Berlin, and I know that's true, although she's in Charité and not here at the American Academy, and especially to be back to the home that once belonged to my grandparents. It is also where my grandparents entertained writers, artists, fellow bankers, and members of Berlin's Beaumont in the 1930s. Cellist Pablo Casal once played in the living room right here in this house. As you know, one of the highlights of the Academy's programming is bringing influential figures to the Academy. We have had Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer and Anthony Scalia. In the music wor world, Sir Clive Gillison, Executive Director of Carnegie Hall and Yo-Yo Ma. And artists including Frank Stella, Ed Ruscha, Carrie James Marshall, Jenny Holzer, and Julie Maritou, to name a few. This evening, I'd like to welcome the architect of the Southwest Wing of the Metropolitan Museum of Art and someone who really needs no introduction whatsoever, Sir David Chipperfield. David established David Chipperfield Architects in 1985. He has taught at the Academy der Bildenden Kunst in Stuttgart and at Yale University and has lectured worldwide at schools of architecture in Austria, Italy, Switzerland, and the United Kingdom and the United States. In 2012, he curated the 13th International Architecture Exhibition of the Venice Biennale. In Germany, of course, you know him well for the Museum of Modern Literature in Marbach, the Museum Volkwang in Essen, and the Elbe Tower in Hamburg. And in his dear Berlin, the marvelous Neues Museum, the renovation of Mies van der Rohe's Neue Gal National Gallery, his firm's office on Joachimstrasse in Mitte, and the James Simon Gallery, which provides the majestic new entrance to Museum Island. Appointed commander of the Order of the British Empire in 2004, David was elected to the Royal Academy in 2008. In 2009, he was bestowed with the Order of the Merit of the Federal Republic of Germany and in 2010 knighted for services to architecture in the UK and Germany. He has also received the Royal Gold Medal for Architecture 
and from the Japan Art Association, both in recognition of his life's work. And so tonight, David will be talking to us about his foundation, RIA, in Galicia, Spain, a nonprofit he established to create a dialogue with the Arusa region's administrations, industry organizations, universities, and civic associations to plan sustainable development for the future. So, uh, I'm sure there are a few more awards that I missed, but um, uh, you get a sense of who we're going to hear from tonight. And so without more uh, accolades, David, I welcome you to the American Academy in Berlin. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> Dan gave a great speech last night, those of you who were here. The bar was raised very high. Um, and um, if that wasn't difficult enough, I'm going very much off-piste in my own uh, lecture. Uh, it seemed like an interesting idea six months ago, not to talk about architecture, but to talk about um, something that uh, we've been involved in for the last four or five years uh, in Galicia, which is the, the foundation that I set up. But I will, do I press this one? I will start in Berlin. Um, and this is a rather peculiar site. Those of you who were here at the time might remember the soft opening of the Noise Museum after 12 years uh, on the project. I know Klaus Dieter Lehmann is here, who was somewhere and was profoundly involved in this whole 12-year project. Um, after 12 years, the Berlin public was finally uh, invited in and they queued for six hours in the drizzling rain and while the press were uh, interested, trying to provoke them into saying uh, how horrible the project was and this the staff had been um, already primed what to do when people came in and made any sort of protest. I show this because, <clears throat> um, the, for me, the Noise Museum was, was really an extraordinary experience in uh, the sort of uh, relationship between architecture and society. It was an extreme relationship in that sense because everybody had an opinion about this project. Um, and while all my German friends apologized for the emotional stress that this was potentially causing to us, I kept saying that on the contrary, you know, that as architects we always ask that people are interested in architecture, so we can't complain when they are. <laughs> um, and of course they were, and uh, this process of dialogue and the idea that uh, in a way architecture belongs to us um, is something that gets forgotten and it's something I want to talk about which is in a way the, the, the relationship between the profession and the community which I think is, is struggling and this is the view from my office in London that is London um, if you haven't been there for a while it looks it doesn't look like London, um, but that's what it's looking like, and that's what it's going to look more and more like. Now, uh, as we sit in our office and uh, with models and design staircases and nice rooms and spaces, we look out of the window, and this is happening uh, in front of us. And so you feel like you're sort of rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Um, <laughs> while the ship is plowing on, uh, regardless. So how can we as professionals, uh, you know, stress about small things while uh, in front of our very eyes, unbeknown to us, in fact, you know, I'm, I'm an architect and I live in London, I don't know what the hell is going on. 
and I'm not talking about Brexit, I'm talking about this. Uh, 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 and therefore, it stresses me that architects have become detached from uh, planning. And more importantly, that planning is a, increasingly a reactive process instead of a proactive process. This, this is so much more evident in Britain, in the Anglo-Saxon world, than it is in the Germanic world, let's say. Um, but still, it's a tendency that is inevitably coming with the power of investment and the power of the private sector. Investment is not very tolerant of being restraint. And at the same time, we are, the mechanisms of restraint and coordination are becoming weaker. So at the very time we need more planning, at the very time we need to coordinate, and I'm not talking only about urban planning, I'm talking about resource planning, about how we're going to deal with really serious environmental issues of, of resources and, and environmental issues and societal issues, which are no longer in the, in the future they are here, that we need more coordination of planning. And at the very time that we need this, we seem to have become uh, politically softer uh, in these terms. And why? So after the war, uh, architects had a much more prominent position, as did planners, and we were planning a brave new world. And uh, this is a housing estate in Sheffield, which... Uh, looks rather beautiful now. Um, it, these projects, these social housing projects in Britain, um, did suffer, and, and um, there were uh, social problems with them. And somehow, the whole uh, um, credibility of planning, of the profession, of these sort of interventions into a society, where did we get the assumption that architects and planners should really set these things out. And they made so many mistakes in traffic, in, in housing, and that, that in a way the, the profession was put back into the box, I would say, you know, that we were not really allowed to, to play in the same way that we had been. And it was, a, you know, there is a serious dimension to that. I mean, there were big mistakes made, but at the same time, uh, there, there was a belief in planning. There was a belief in uh, corded coordinating how a city should be. And I would say, you know, in Europe, that has persisted. You know, in Berlin, you have a city architect. In London, we have no city architect. The last city architect in Britain, I think, lost his job about 10 years ago. I mean, that was... So we have no... We have defused totally the public sector. Margaret Thatcher essentially um, took away the responsibility of... Uh, the public infrastructure to be responsible and basically said the private sector knows how to do these things better. Well, the private sector does not build social housing. The private sector does not build schools. It builds for profit. And if there's not profit, it doesn't step in. So this is my uh, introduction from a profession. This is sort of how my day job connects to what I'm now going to show you, which is not my day job. Um, and this happened very accidentally. Um, 25 years ago, we accidentally um, moved our summer um, destination to the northwest corner of Galicia, uh, of Spain, called Galicia. It's one of the poorest areas of Spain. Um, it's a little bit isolated. Um, the Spanish, I would say, are slightly racist against Galicians, um, a little bit like the, the English are about the Welsh. Um, they are a sort of strange, isolated culture, uh, a little bit behind. Um, they, uh, they sort of, uh, yeah, so, and the, the Spanish don't naturally go there because it rains a lot, it's the Atlantic. Um, if they're going to have holiday, they're going to go to the south. And, and so do all other tourists. So it's a sort of forgotten corner. The only thing that the Spanish acknowledge is that the, they produce the best food, the best fish, and the best uh, food products. 
partly because it's so old-fashioned that it's still very uh, small-scale uh, made, and, and of course the, the, the sea itself is um, you know, an important factor in that. So we accidentally ended up in this strange place. The, the um, capital of, of Galicia is Santiago, so you, you know where it is now, and Santiago is an extraordinary city, and it somehow um, embodies this Celtic and slightly mystical and then this religious. Uh, and, so it, uh, and as a city, um, it has this incredibly strong uh, physical architecture. It's a granite uh, city, and Galicia is a, is a granite culture. It's, it's, it's common. Um, it has this Celtic background, and here we even have the dreaded bagpipes, um, <laughs> Uh, which for the first few years of our holidays we were charmed and the children used to love them. Now they sort of drive us mad. But um, So there is both you know, um, physical, tangible and uh, non-tangible culture, very, very powerful in Galicia. It's, it's, it has a strong uh, identity, both physically and culturally. We're back to architecture. So... For some strange reason, um, well, the reason's clear, that after the building of the Bilbao Guggenheim Museum and the extraordinary um, uh, effect of that to uh, an otherwise um, industrial city and the fact that, that Bilbao became then a, a cultural destination because of a piece of architecture, um, every mayor or every pres regional president in, in Spain decided that they needed uh, also a piece of architecture that would make their city or their region also a destination. Um, so Santiago uh, decided, well, more importantly, the president of Galicia at the time, uh, Manuel Fraga, who was the last remaining uh, minister from Franco's uh, uh, ministry and was at some point the, 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 Span the Spanish ambassador in London and was Franco's um, minister of propaganda, who by all accounts was one of the better influences on Franco, remained as the president of Galicia for many years, in, in fact until he died. Maybe. He commissioned a competition to uh, build a city of culture in Santiago, which is already a city of culture. So why, I mean, Bilbao, you know, in a way, as, a, as a, um, uh, an industrial port, there was some sort of logic about building a cultural centre and also in terms of funding, of course, central government was very keen that the Basque region um, received uh, support. Peter Eisenman won the competition and... Uh, <coughs> started to build a cultural complex that was nearly as big as the Lincoln Center uh, for a capital city of a, of a region which only has two and a half million people. Um, when Fraga died, the, the initiative sort of died with him, or the will to continue with the project um, died, and they were left with this uh, white elephant. And every regime, I mean, the, the, the political... The, 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 the political party stayed in power. Pepe Galicia is very much, um, always has been quite right-wing, stayed in power. And, and the Pepe following uh, administrations never had the courage to say, we're not going to finish it, until the most recent president, um, Fejo, Alberto, Alberto Fejo, um, publicly came out and said, you know what, we're never going to finish this building, so we need to confront it. And at that point, he called me. Well, he didn't call me right then. I mean, uh, around that period, I got a phone call. Uh, he, knowing that I was a, a sort of honorary Galician um, and an architect, you know, could I come and advise him what to do? So I didn't have really any suggestions that could, are repeatable. Um, uh, and uh, instead, I said what I would be more willing to do would be to um, give your administration advice on planning. Because what we had realised, uh, 
uh, what I had realised and Evelyn realised and family realised over 20 years or so of this most extraordinary place was that uh, the, this un, relatively unspoiled and rather beautiful uh, part of Europe um, was not under threat, but certainly not doing itself any, any um, good by uh, a lot of the developments that were happening. So these are the two faces, in a way, of Galicia. So there's the, the natural beauty. And actually, one thing that's very interesting about Galicia is that the, the natural beauty is also where the wealth comes from, where the whole economy comes from, because they grow mussels and, and, and seashells, and, um, you know, seafood and fishing and everything to do with uh, sea, the sea, with agriculture and forestry. So the nature is its resource. Um, when fishermen earn a lot of money, they do the most strange things to their towns. <laughs> and, and if there's no planning, and there's absolutely no planning infrastructure, they can do anything they want, and so do mayors, and so do planning uh, consultants and everybody else. So there is this strange paradox that uh, in this most beautiful of places, you can get the most ugliest of towns. Um, the president, uh, and it is a, it's, an, it's a very identified condition. They even have a you know, phrase for this Galician ugliness, which is what they do. Um, and the only merit it has is a sort of innocence. Um, the president, aware of this problem, then sort of said, well, that would be great if you could help us because we need to control the quality of our architecture. So would you do that? And I said, well, I'm, I'm really happy to work in my region, which is this one, uh, this is area. The, the coast is a number of fjords. Um, they're very famous for that. And this is the, so I said, I, I would work on the here. He said, well, why not take the whole of Galicia? I said, no, I wanted to do <laughs> something that has a concrete result. I wanted to work on a, a small scale. And we started to do that. And here you see you know, this incredible uh, nature, uh, this blessed place, and then how we are, without planning, damaging it. We're eating willfully green space when we don't need to. Um, so what came out of this very early um, work, the first year or so, was a realization that actually you can't stop people building bad architecture. You cannot legislate against that. That's absolutely impossible. Um, but, but actually the issues were much more complex than that. And what you can start to consider is the natural environment, the, the fact how development is destroying uh, or eroding the natural environment, that's something you could legislate about. You could legislate about the type of uh, um, built environment, how, how towns are expanding into Greenland. You could start thinking about the identity of those villages. But there were a number of issues which became clear to us. So we started as architects, and then we sort of put our pens down. We said, this is not an architectural problem. And so I have a team of, pe team of architects who haven't been able to design a thing for the last four years and are committed to another set of, of considerations, which I'm going to talk about. In many ways, this, this um, exercise of the last four or five years has been working at two levels. The first is the immediate level, which is a, a little bit like any of you would behave in a place where you like. You would sort of... When you, when you arrive there and discover that someone has knocked a building down or all of a sudden they put a car park where there was a beach, or you, know, you would get cross and say, well, why can't we do something about it? So one of my, you know, one level that, I'm, that we are operating is a bit like that, in a way the, the immediate, the, the things in front of us, you know, trying to help this community that we've been involved in for the last 25 years. Um, to be honest, I think I would have not sort of carried on if it was just about trying to stop the worst things happening because it's a sort of slightly frustrating and, and hopeless exercise in one way. 
And I, it's only because there's, an, there's another layer to this, I think, which is that, um, and, and it's the one I introduced in the beginning, that what we've learned out of this is that planning is critical to everything. And it's absolutely critical to the protection of resources. And I'm going to talk more about that. So my hidden agenda in this is a belief in planning. And therefore, I've used Galicia as a sort of laboratory to say that if you can get people from the scientific community, the local universities, which we have, the University of Vigo and the University of Santiago and La Coruña, if you can get the local community and also the local um, commercial community, and if you can get the politicians and you can put them in a room, you can make decisions and you can actually do a hell of a lot more than you can do as an architect. And without that type of coordination, as an architect, there's not much you can do. So this has been the uh, sort of the thing that's motivated me uh, beyond just trying to deal with the, the immediate practical inconveniences and things which I find stressful. There's one other thing, which is that what's been strange about this exercise that has been going on for now, the, I think we're in the fifth year, ra in a rather patronising way as architects, we um, identified all the issues that the community has, and we kept talking to them about this. And at some point, a number of my friends said, but you, you can't keep telling us the problems we have because I'm not sure we feel them. Um, and I said, but you must. You have a demographic crisis. Young people are leaving. You don't, you know, it's very low, it's a lot of unemployment. And uh, it's, a, it's one of the poorest areas of, of Spain. And their response slightly was, Yes, but we still have a good life. So there's another text in here, which has grown and grown, which is quality of life is not based on disposable income and GDP. And it's been, in a way, a real uh, lesson for us and something which is, in a way, the bigger text that we're, we are interested in. And this, of course, links into sustainability and issues of, of uh, resources and, and consumerism and happiness and, yeah, quality of life. And so what this project's become more and more about, it started off with uh, the president thinking I might, have, might impose some sort of aesthetic plan over the whole of Galicia where everybody had to paint their house the same colour and only use roof tiles the same colour, um, to say actually what we're trying to do is protect the quality of life, which it sounds incredibly grand and pretentious, and of course it is, um, but that's what we've um, sort of found ourselves doing. The, as I said before, the, the, um, the nature is the thing which gives uh, the economy, and therefore it's not so difficult to persuade people who have been growing clams for 500 years. Well, they haven't been, but their predecessors have been. Um, to explain that the quality of water is quite important. I mean, they'll tell you before you do. In fact, this was the, one of the first exercises that we did in the first year, was to return to the president of Galicia and said, the first thing you have to do is protect the water quality. And this was, we stepped on a political um, red button that made him rather irritated in that first time um, uh, because he felt that this was a political statement more than, a, um, you know, you're an architect, what's that got to do with you sort of thing. Um, however, now whenever he talks about Galicia in any part of the world, he says the first thing that we protect in Galicia is our water. Uh, and all of our life and our economy and our culture comes from water. So. Um, I have, I mean, there is, uh, there is a cheat in this whole thing that I have an access to a rather intelligent uh, president who has a, a reasonable control over a region that has two and a half million people and he has supported our initiative. So again, I would say this is the context of Galicia, that the nature is providing uh, a way of life and therefore it's not so difficult to say, hey guys, protect that. It is difficult in, a, in an environment where there is so little employment and so little opportunities. The idea of saying, uh, you know, 
this is your future, is quite difficult if um, uh, that sounds like you're just protecting nature. There are all sorts of investments that people want to do here. I mean, for instance, fish farming is something which um, uh, a lot of Norwegian companies wanted to come here. But the, the, the local fishermen are very against that because it, it brings antibiotics and does all this. So again, these things become political because the mayors want that type of investment, but the local people don't. So we've ended up um, playing a critical role in balancing these three considerations, the natural environment, the built environment, and the economy. And, and what I've been arguing with the president is that you can't protect uh, the built environment if you're not also thinking about the economy, and you can't protect the natural environment if you're not putting those three things together. So this is Galicia, and this is the, is the particular fjord that we are talking about, and there's the coast, I think I have a pointer. So uh, Santiago is here. Uh, the other, there's only three uh, main cities, Coruña here, Santiago here, and Vigo down here. Um, Galicia has, I think, um, one third of the settlements of Spain. It's one, you know, it's a small region, and yet it, it has an enormous dis dispersed uh, population and very few big metropolitan centers. And it's very much characterized by these fjords, which is where all the seashells are grown, seafood is grown, and by forest. And here you can see a zoom in, and this is the, the, the rear that we're talking about, which is a little um, ecology in itself. And one of the things that we've been talking about these years is that the ecology is not only a natural ecology, it's an ecology where man is the central part of, of that ecology and that's somehow about trying to think about protection not as an ideological uh, passive thing but protection as part of a dynamic relationship with with economy and community and um, one of the extraordinary things about this region and I'll talk about this a bit more is that it's it's retained a sort of small scale uh, economies um, all of the farming and all of the fishing is done um, on a very small scale. There are no giant um, companies. And, uh, of course, they would like to modernize. And our advice for the last four years is saying you're, you're so far behind um, that you might find yourself in front because food production globally, we're having to completely rethink about how we're doing it. So instead of them trying to adopt new um, ideas, I'm arguing with them that small-scale uh, agriculture, small-scale food production is actually a safeguard because it also guards uh, quality and how we produce. And, of course, those, those of you have heard the um, discussions in England about how we are now going to have um, chlorinated chicken from America as part of Brexit um, only exposes the whole problem of, of um, large-scale food production. So what we did I, um, was to start from the beginning uh, without, without any a priori um, ideas uh, to accept that this was not an architectural decision, but we would work as architects. And we would work as architects trying to link things together, because only by linking things together could you, could you solve them. And therefore, um, and, 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 and at the big, so in the early days of this, we, we identified a number of things which went way beyond the issues of aesthetics. So while, again, while I was asked to, to do this because the president was worried about how the towns looked, we started to say, but well, that's the least of your problems, and let's think about uh, things that we can do things about. So, and, and dominating this whole thing is an issue which is prevalent throughout Europe, which is the, I don't know whether evacuation is the right translation, it should be migration, I suppose, of young people from rural areas into metropolitan areas. I mean, this is an, this is an issue affecting the whole of Europe, and I would say it's something that's been totally neglected. We've, we've 
We've been thinking a lot about cities in the last 20 or 30 years, and we haven't thought at all about the, the, the non-metropolitan centres. I would say that... Um, well, I'll come back to that. Then um, the other... Connected to that, I would say that the, the towns have sort of mm, been neglected. Uh, and I would explain that. And they've lost some of their identity. Um, the other thing that, you know, so again, if we're looking at the protection of environment, you know, thinking about the built environment and the economy, we were very interested in the idea that um, food is the dominant uh, and producing food is the dominant economy and therefore what they have to think about is how to give value to that production because it's of a very high quality. So this is the demographic map um, of Galicia and I think the red, uh, I mean, it, just jumping ahead, I mean, I can give you the, the, I mean, the, the young people are in the green bits, you know, and everybody, you know, the average age in the red is, is, is 65 plus. So, uh, and we are really losing young people. The, the, the issue of ugliness of buildings, um, I argue, isn't really an issue of, only of ugliness, but it's also about the most important thing is about identity, I would say, is that, um, and these issues are connected. If you want people, if you want young people to feel that they're living in the right place, then clearly you have to make sure that the, the identity of that place is, um, is strong. And I would say we're working from the right point. As I said in the beginning, Galicians sort of love their nature and they, are, they would say that they have a high quality of life, which is very much to do with their place. And this is, of course, as an architect, this is a sort of, this, you know, the, the, the dominant subtext of this is that I believe that quality of life is, is partly, I mean, you know, if, if you're ill and you've got no money and you've got no job, I mean, clearly those are issues beyond that. But certainly sense of place, the place where we live, is a, a very important factor to our, the sense of ourselves and our happiness. And I think this is something that's been neglected too much. Um, I don't think it's too um, bold to say that Brexit is very much fueled by um, uh, people who feel unhappy where they are. They feel disenfranchised. And of course, part of that is to do with their economic condition. But I would also say part of it is to do with the environment within which they live. And in Britain, I think we haven't done any uh, you know, we've been very neglectful in terms of uh, looking after the, the built environment. And I think that's, we are, you know, the chickens have come home to roost, as it were. So if we are looking at a sort of sustainable Galicia, I've been arguing that the identity of the built environment and the community is really important. We've already talked about the idea that, that the sort of mini agricultural system is something which is... Um, at the base of the, of the community, but at the same time, if you are the son or daughter of uh, a farmer, you don't really get that excited about a life of picking potatoes and milking the cow. Therefore, we have to think about how we might um, think about how this sector modernizes without losing its um, core uh, values and, and approach. The final element is, is the idea of sort of um, stepping back and taking, taking an, an ability to plan. Because as, as most places, the, 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 the willingness and the ability to um, make strategic decisions as opposed to uh, intuitive decisions. Um, is quite difficult. So there's a number of informations here, which, I mean, this is a, is a, a precy of a whole lot of things that we discovered. But, uh, and, and one of them is the, the, the amount of empty buildings which there are in a town, which, you know, so you can talk about the quality of architecture, but if 25% of the buildings in the town are empty, it's quite difficult to make a 
a, a town which has some sort of vibrancy. If at the same time you're building on, you're building the same amount of new houses on Greenland, then that's even more stupid. Um, so why can't we stop building on Greenland until the empty houses are built? Well, that's a political, you know, you can't do that. So we need the politicians to buy into those sorts of decisions. But these, the reason they don't is because in order to, to make that type of operation, it's a political operation. So it's easier than just to let people build on Greenland. You will see here that 82% of car driving. I mean, you'll notice in this town, one, the, the most, the, the thing which comes every time we talk about planning, we end up with cars, um, and that's everywhere. And one of the things that we imagined was that if you stopped cars, you know, if you, if you limited cars, you would have a crisis because everybody is driving in from outside coming into the towns. We discovered that, and we did, we did all of this data ourselves. We did, you know, a lot of research. 82% of car journeys are taken by people within the village. I mean, they, they go less than 400 meters in their car. That, so when the mayor... So there is a great reticence to act on things like that because that's too... It's much easier to make another car park than it is to think about how to control... Parking. The mayor said to me at some point, you can do anything you want, but just don't talk about cars. Um, and I said, but if you don't talk about cars, you can't solve anything. This is, I mean, I, I, forgive me because clearly my whole position is, is slightly contaminated by a sort of over-romantic over idea of this place. So, um, I, you know, I don't apologize for that. Um, and this image uh, goes to the core of this, that, you know, the whole, uh, the whole identity of Galicia was given by this relationship between the water, the nature, um, the, the way that we build next to it, and the activity that comes from it. So in this image, I always like it because it somehow talks about all of those th three things coming together, the sort of natural world, the built world, and the... And the the economy. So these are the three things that we've, we've been interested in trying to find a relationship between. Um, the, the natural, what I've, I've talked continuously, you know, it's, it's stunning. It's, we have 70% um, is forest. We have this extraordinary uh, uh, nature through the sea. Uh, more than 65% of the population live um, in relationship to the sea. Um, so nature is, is the, the dominant thing. You can see that in the field. Um, the built environment, as I've explained, is a sort of disaster. Why would this possibly... I mean, how could you even think about doing these things? And, of course, you know, it's, it's left... <laughs> when you build little houses, nothing can go really wrong. But when people are allowed to build big things, it can start to go wrong. So how come this... Uh, planning is is so neglected um, and you can see here the black is settlement so you can see that the settlements gravitate to the water and I've talked already about how nature and the economy are somehow related and here are the main economic uh, centers gravitating to the sea so what we started to do in the sort of uh, second and third years of this process was to try and understand um, better, you know, to, to really have good information. Um, it's true of everywhere, but I think fishermen probably are, are, are you know, even more exaggerated in this matter. To get True information out of a fisherman is quite difficult, and we know that. You know, whenever they catch a fish, it's always you know, the one that got away was always bigger, and the, um, so they always exaggerate. Uh, if you ask in this region, you know, is the water quality going down? Half of them will say no, it's fine, and the other half will say, yeah. uh, are there still fish? Half of them will say yes, and half of them will say no. So, actually, what we realised is that we needed to be, if we were to become a reliable agency, we had to become reliable and that therefore information and the, the quality of our information was profoundly important. Um, 
at the end of that uh, um, uh, data collection uh, period, we, we sort of had a, a sort of shopping list of issues that we felt that were absolutely critical to, uh, to the progress of our work. And they were, first of all, um, the reconsideration of the existing uh, economies uh, and trying to help develop new economic opportunities. Um, related to that were the, was the, the port areas, which are huge industrial port areas, which actually erode the identity now of the, the towns and how these could become an asset and how we could get people to invest in this uh, in innovation and, and working in these areas. And then um, we come back to traffic, that traffic is absolutely destroying <laughs> the identity of the towns um, and the, the, the issue of empty buildings and the identity of, of the, the towns themselves. And then further on, related to that, was the protection of the green areas outside of the port. So these issues were um, you know, important in terms of how we, we uh, understood uh, the challenges of the community. And so we didn't, um, I mean, invariably, whatever research we did, we were met with sort of uh, quizzical response about saying, well, why are you asking this? No one's ever asked us these questions before. We would go to places where they were building uh, industrial uh, um, sheds and say, well, why are you building these here? And they said, well, we were told to. Um, and then we'd say, but, you know, why are they so big? And we said, no idea. The, the mayor told us. And then, but uh, I, do you need them to be big? No, they're much too big. We'd like them to be smaller because we always have to subdivide them because most of our tenants want small things. So, so why are you building these huge buildings, these industrial sheds, which are an eyesore? So then you realize that there's just a complete lack of integration of information and, and planning. Um, and that goes through the whole thing. So this, is, if you've ever eaten a padron pepper, I don't know whether you see on menus that there's a padron pepper. I mean, it's become a, um, a, nearly an insidious uh, part of the contemporary uh, menu. This is padron. All the peppers are meant to come from here, except they don't. They come from Morocco because uh, these people cannot protect the... the, the uh, the nomenclature of, the, of the, the product. So when you ask them, why are you, why are you not protecting this, then you discover that they, ha they don't have the political power to do that. So we kept finding ourselves in these um, uh, unconnected conditions. Um, the same was... so so part of this story that I'm talking about is clearly about the identity of the place and the discomfort that a lot of the, the industrial development has produced. The ports are all, um, in a way, very important and, and viable and critical to the economy, but at the same time, um, most of them are empty now and not being used, and they, they are under a completely different administration than the towns. So whenever we are arguing with the mayor, why are we not doing this? Or anything, um, the mayor says, I have no jurisdiction over that whatsoever. So again, it's a situation where we have to get the administration to make these changes. So we keep finding situations where um, we need to find political connections to solutions. Um, and again, I, you know, so research, we, we were visited by um, a very famous Japanese restaurant that came and, and um, worked with us for a week. And we took them to see all the food production. And this is clam, this is clam farmers. And again, they can't protect their product. So even though it has a high value, this is Caril. It's a very famous, if you're in Madrid and you see on a menu, it will say clams from Caril. And this guy in the middle will say, well, of course they're not, because we, we could never produce that amount of clams. And then you say, well, why don't you complain in the European community? And then he said, OK, well, I am the chairman, and 
Juan is the vice chairman, and when are we going to go to Brussels? You know, the, so they don't have that resource. So now, you know, of course, as an agency, they find it interesting that we might act on their behalf. There are so many sub-stories to this which are interesting, where, again, they say, well, we can't be too aggressive because we don't even produce our own... Um, seeds. We have to import them from France. And you say, well, why don't you make your own seeds? Well, because we don't have the infrastructure. So there, we've, there are all of these things which could be linked up, which are not linked up. Um, back to the dreaded traffic um, program, which is really a, or the issue of traffic and what, how it's damaging the region and the community. I'm not so much worried about it on a sort of regional level, but in terms of, um, you know, what it does to, to a town, you know, parking becomes uh, something that happens in every, uh, every public space. And in many ways it's harmless, but what it does do, and this is a sort of quite shocking condition, so we have a series of six or seven... Uh, small towns, and the street used to be the heart of the town. So half the town, you know, one half goes down to the port, the other goes up to the hill. The church is on this side, the school is on this side, and this was a social space. Now, what happens is that the, the street is traffic. Um, and look at this. I mean, there's even a, uh, a Grand Prix uh, barrier <laughs> to protect these kids. And uh, I wonder why there are no shops here. So this is a traffic problem. Well, it's not really, because if we then say to the traffic engineers, can we reduce the traffic speed, they will say, why? It's not our problem. We, we, a traffic engineer has no interest in reducing the speed of traffic. And if you say, yeah, but old ladies can't cross... OK, but we'll put a crossing or something. Yeah, but, um, uh, you know, it, it destroys the town. Well, that's not our problem. So I'll come back to that. But it's a very good example of um, how, how can it be that this is a traffic problem, not an urban problem? And we are trying to say it's not a traffic problem. It's, a, it's how traffic... Uh, contributes to, to other issues. Um, so the other aspect of, as I've repeated, is the idea of regeneration. So this is a bit sad, and I shouldn't really say this publicly, but the mayor instigated a program of remaking the pavement of this area, but at the same time, first of all, didn't bother to think about how all of the 32 different service um, covers should be thought about. And secondly, there's only two buildings on the whole square which are occupied. So why would you make new pavement if you're not going to have a strategy of uh, re-owning uh, these buildings? So the mayor says, well, what can I do about that? It's a political decision. So then when we speak to the politicians and say, is there, could there not be a law where if these buildings are empty for a certain number of years, they could be repossessed? Absolutely. So why don't we do it? Yeah, maybe we should. Okay, fine. Um, <laughs> but that's not going to happen from the mayor. It's not going to happen from traffic engineers. It's not going to happen from the people who had the contract to put the paving down. So it, we keep finding ourselves in these pivotal positions where it's sort of weird because why are we doing it as architects? But in a way, if we could get all of these buildings back into ownership, and this is a, a lively square, you've done a hell of a lot more than you can if you build a building. And, of course, there are wonderful, you know, that these towns have, you know, if you find a good Galician town, they are, they are absolutely wonderful. And what's happened to them is, is disappointing. And here you can see typical examples of, of just very good buildings just left behind while they build seven-storey apartment building in the background. It, abso it makes absolutely no, no sense whatsoever. I took the president on this street and counted 32 empty buildings, you know, and they're all buildings from the beginning of the last century, very nice buildings, but it's an issue of ownership. So this is not an architectural problem, it's not an urban design problem, it's 
it's an issue of identity, it's an issue of community. And why should we at the same time be building on green space? Because it's, it's, it's more difficult to find out who owns these buildings, to negotiate the ownership of it, to take it back into control, to put people in it, than to build another building on a, green, on a piece of, 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 of um, green space. And this is what's happening, is that they're building back into green space instead of... So when you point this out... Of course, everyone says, yeah, it's stupid. And then, but, you know, it's the mayor that's saying it's stupid. Um, how do you intervene in these decisions? And, of course, in this situation, it's reasonably innocent. It's reasonably benign. But to be honest, it ha it's happening in every planning condition that we're involved in, whether that's, you know, in Stockholm or Zurich or London or wherever. The ability to link issues together is critical to our, our inability uh, to, to plan. Um, so what we've really done in these years is to create this sort of uh, independent agency and where the, as, as uh, with this privileged position we are um, in a way used by the community, by the scientific community uh, and by the, econ the local economies and to some degree the politicians, because the local mayors know I have access to the president, and the president knows I have, I have access to the mayors, and that's, that's a bit of trading that goes on, but it means that we can actually get things done. And we are, you know, one of the things that we're, we're continuously doing is bringing these issues, making them important. I mean, what we've realised, and what the mayors have sort of quite liked about this is, they say, but what's interesting what you're doing is that you're overstating the problem every time. Because you know? there are problems that we have, and we keep having to solve, you know, every day, every mayor has a small problem about parking on this. And so what they're saying is, what's interesting about this strategy is that you're, you're sort of booming the problems up to a point of which they become identifiable and in a way strategically approached. And this is a big presentation we did in Santiago de Compostela, uh, with the uh, local administration and at the point where the, uh, we presented the five major initiatives that we want to pursue and they were all approved by, by the president. That's the president <coughs> there. Local mayors. Um, workshops with, in this case, these are uh, people from the University of Vigo, um, the, uh, some, someone from the ministry, uh, and continuous you know, participation with the community. And one of the things is that the community is, and, and this is the team, there's a president again, uh, a mayor, a mayor, another mayor. Um, yeah, different. Uh, and um, so this, the, this exercise in communication of identifying issues and in a way... <laughs> It depends on everybody agreeing that those issues are issues. Because if they don't think they're issues, it, it, it doesn't work. And so it needs to be, um, you know, all of these things need to be brought forward. And it's extraordinary how much, um, how, how much opinion people have, how much information you get not from, uh, you know, from, from uh, text, but by people themselves um, back in the water. Uh, and the, the different communities that we are in touch with continue. So we've become a sort of focus because we have everybody's trust. No one really trusts the politicians, but they trust us, that we have no, no agenda apart from the community. And that is an enormous tool. I mean, it's quite, quite interesting that your innocence becomes uh, the best tool you can have. And, of course, it does require a certain amount of precision and, and, uh, uh, and, and engagement. There's the president again. Um, and with everybody. These are, Evelyn, you know who these guys are. They're, they're, uh, this is um, from uh, Aguinho, Pedro Mayor. So these are, these are, they don't look like they're powerful, but he controls <laughs> the whole, all the fishing rights in one of the most important parts of the Ria. I think he does as well, and I can't remember. I think one of these, one, there's one woman who's, I think it's her. Anyway, so they are, 
you can't move without them. You know, you can't make any decisions about the whole fishing thing without them, and they are part of it. And you know, they are. Um, you know, what's very, what's been really uh, important about this is that we haven't been pushed away. We ha- the community would have every right to say, "Well, what the hell do you know about this, and what's it got to do with you?" There is such an innocence, I would say, um, and such a sort of uh, benevolence that the fact that we're taking interest in their concerns. I'm sure they're going to be disappointed if we don't solve anything, but the idea that we are listening to those issues and trying to bring them to to some sort of conclusion is something that they enjoy. And this is the the person that said to me uh, not so long ago when I said, but how come, you know, can I say that people here have a good quality of life? And he said, yes. And I said, why? And he said, because we expect so little. You know, which I thought was a profound clue. Is that all it takes? You know, that we don't have to expect so much and then we can be happier? I mean, maybe in our challenging uh, times of re- resource and environmental... So this, they have something to teach us. And I think this is the, the thing that we're in. So... This sort of sloppy and uh, vague series of things which we keep trying to give discipline to, it's like herding sheep, we're trying to give them. So, um, we've continuously tried to um, uh, move into concrete examples. We don't, we don't want to end up with a series of plans. We've refused to do any sort of things which end up with a plan and say this should be the new development plan or this should be that. We have no interest in that. We're only interested in in actions. And so these are the, the sort of uh, five, sect- five actions that we're, we're, we're pushing. And so one of them, so uh, just going back, so uh, we are uh, promoting sustainable industries. That's an incredibly vague thing to do. How the, how the hell does that work? Well, we did, believe it or not, a two day seminar or workshop on seaweed growing. Uh, because what the University of Vigo, there's a number of people here from the University of Vigo, told us that actually one of the things which could be a very useful future uh, industry uh, is seaweed. Um, and because the, we have the, what, we've, what we've become fascinated by is that fishing, fishing is a very different problem because we're running out of fish. But clams and things like that where you plant them it's like growing potatoes so you you can you farm it and you you bring them out after six months and same with mussels so we've been trying to find other products by which you can as it were farm in a very sustainable way and so seaweed is one of them and the university of vigo is very keen that this program should be pushed and they've been working on this for years and we said but have you ever done it no so but why why not But but we don't have you know, they, they have the theory, but they, they never have the practice. So we've linked up with the politicians, so we got everybody together and said, is this something we can do? And so on these platforms where they normally grow mussels, we will do uh, a, a, a trial growing seaweed, which, by the way, has the same value now as... So these are the platforms that they grow mussels on. And there's only a limited number of mussels that we can grow in the water. And so the seaweed also cleans the water. So the people in... Vigo, the scientists are really interested in pushing this system. So, again, it's, you know, my team sort of says, well, it was a great, you know, so how did it go? I said, great, but, you know, it's funny for us because we don't get, you know, it's, we are, we are, we make things happen, but we're not quite sure how that resolves itself. But it's clearly, it becomes an interesting uh, way of operating. And then, uh, so that's one concrete project, as it were. We're actually trying to help promote, and we're working with the University of Vigo, and they're, you know, they have a whole program of other uh, initiatives to do with um, marine research that we are trying to team up with the local politicians and make actual applied experiments as opposed to theoretical. The same with um, the urban uh, regeneration. We've, we've, we've now setting into motion at number of planning. The red shows all the empty buildings, by the way. I mean, that's sort of, um, and we've mapped and we've, we've, we assembled a whole t- 
team who then knocked on everybody's doors and talked to everybody um, and asked everybody what they felt about things. And, and from that, we generated uh, a new plan. Um, it's too complicated to explain, but you know, from this, there was, there was a huge amount of participation. By, I mean, we took the ugliest part uh, of the region, and this is really an ugly town, and we, we then uh, showed how if you, again, you know, if, why can't we get these back, and it wouldn't be that much. I mean, you don't change a huge amount, but it starts to give some pride back to the village and the town, and, and I mean, unfortunately, you know, this is too late, but um, <laughs> you can see. Um, empty fish markets, you know, why can't we start thinking about moving the, the daily market, which is at the moment outside, and is, why can't we move that in? You know, again, we put this in front of the president of the region, says, well, it's, it sounds to me like a rather good idea, why don't we do it? So you can, you know, I'm, again, as an architect, I'm a bit embarrassed to show this because it's a sort of... Uh, you know, it doesn't have any great architectural merit, but actually, you know, as a project. And then finally, I just showed this project, which is now, um, we're now pushing ahead, which is the issue of, of, of traffic, which I showed you this, this problem of the streets being um, running through the villages. And here, here are the villages and, and the main road, and you can see it here. So all of the towns are along the water, and this A305, which is running through and actually dissecting these. So here's a charming village, Palmeira. This is the port. Uh, how the, and uh, it's here. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's here. Um, no, sorry, it's here. It's here. The port is there, and the other half of the village is on the other side. So, that, so that's how it's dissected. Your chance of crossing the road is, is uh, you know, negligible. But the interesting thing is, if we can bring speed down from 50 to 30, <laughs> you can reduce the lane width. We can get uh, nearly a meter extra of sidewalk on, on either side, and then all of a sudden, you can change the, the whole effect. So we've worked it out that if you change the speed limit from, uh, from uh, 50 to 30, from here to here, it adds one minute and seven seconds onto your journey. Um, again, the, the traffic engineers were so reluctant to participate in this. And finally, I got the president to send me the head of traffic to come down in the summer. And we stood on the road, and, and I tried to cross him. Uh, you know, we tried to cross the road, and I explained that, you know, here's the school, here's the church, here's the port. You know, people are living up here, and you can't get across. And at that point, he started to understand that this is not a road engineering issue, it's an urban issue. Um, and, and it's not a matter of changing, look, it's 70, you know, it's, it's not a matter of change. You Just changing the sign doesn't do it, because people don't observe that. So you have to change the, the whole atmosphere that it feels that you are driving into a village, you know. So at the moment, this is a continuous, I mean, why they need all this parking all the way down here, you know. Um, at the moment, the road just, it's, it's the road that goes through the town. Whereas what we're trying to do is to say, you stop at the town and you enter a town, you drive out the other end. And it's not that complicated. Um, you know, this is the current condition with the sort of Formula One uh, barrier. We can now widen both sides of the street by a meter. That means we have enough space for trees. And magically, you know, shops are going to pop up, of course, uh, we, we hope. Um, and uh, again, you know, so you can see we can widen sidewalks. We can create uh, a surface so that everybody uh, crosses. And you can, through these, I mean, you know, I have to admit, I'm not particularly interested in traffic control or this type of project, because someone said, well, why are you doing this? I, said, yeah, I don't know, but, you know, I, I'm not really interested in that. But I'm interested in this town regaining its identity. And then you say, well, I'm not really interested in that. I'm, I'm interested in keeping young people here and trying to make sure that this place retains 
its extraordinary identity and its quality of life. And these small things, I think, either help or erode. You know, if you don't do it properly, they erode. Um, and, of course, it's a, it's a tiny uh, thing to do, but it, it has some sort of contribution. Um, also, in a small community, it's amazing how much press you get from, uh, you know, this is the, the approval of the project. Um, I managed to get the president of Galicia to my house and give him lunch, and we got him to put half the money in, and he got on the phone and called the mayor, and he agreed the other half of the money. So it's, it's now uh, going ahead. The interesting thing is everybody that complains about crossing the road and all of the old people... Uh, this is Manuel, who's running the, the team there. He's presenting the project to a lot of grumpy villagers who, um, when we ask them about crossing the road, they're furious about the road. But when we started to say, You're gonna, we're going to slow the traffic down, they're furious that they can't drive their car <laughs> 50 kilometers an hour. So we are two people. We are, you know, the old lady crossing the road who you know, absolutely is furious that she can't cross. But we're also the old lady who's driving the car that is crossed that she can't anymore drive at 50 kilometers. So Paul Manuel is here uh, explaining to everybody that um, this was, is not the end of their life. And, and actually, at this, I mean, but this is what we have to do. You can see, and it's, it's rather charming. Anyway, I think that's the last, uh, yeah, that's the last image. And, um, so I'm happy to answer any questions. I apologise for the parochial nature of it. I should say, in, in, in enormous admiration, never have so many architects thought about so many things without building a building. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you really went way out of your comfort zone here. I, 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 extraordinary. Um, but I'm curious, you, you, how many of the tools of an architect in your mind were you using for, to design this plan, or how much did you have to really sort of invent? Really? All of them. I think, you know, and that's why I started with Noise Museum. I think that Noise Museum was a negotiation. I mean, it, clearly, we have skills, which are, to, you know, the, our words and the stuff, the stuff that we work with uh, is physical stuff. We like making rooms, and we like making windows, and we like making staircases, and we like concrete, and we like stone, and we, you know, that's our, that's our stuff. Um, but uh, uh, and we can make uh, nice things but that stuff should be for some reason um, and therefore uh, we, and, and we are we are not artists we can't just go home and decide we're going to design a school um, and hope that someone will build it tomorrow I mean, so we are totally complicit we are, we, we are social uh, we, we, are, we, we are in service in some way. We mm -hmm. cannot operate without them. And that, that's why it's more interesting. I mean, in theory, that's why it's more vital than a painting or a sculpture. Or anything, because it's not, an in, it's not just an individual act. It's a collective act. But as our ability to act collectively erodes or softens, then our role as architects, acting on behalf of society also becomes more difficult. So we do have nice commissions from museums which still operate in a way in, in a sort of um, to the benefit of society. And there are clearly there are what I call the green zones, you know, where you can take your flak jacket and your helmet off and relax because it's a nice board of trustees or a museum director. I mean, you know, in a way you can talk about architecture and convention. But when you're out there uh, in the normal world, in the commercial world, then uh, you need your helmet and your, your, your bulletproof vest. And you're not, you know, our, our ability to operate uh, societally uh, is parallel to the, to the willingness or the, the stamina that society has to, to, to act. When you go around the communities um, in the area and talk about your plans... Do they see you as an architect, a friend of the president, a smart guy from the UK? What, what's, what's their relationship to you? And that's not meant disrespectfully at all. No, I'm just I, 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 look, cl clearly I'm leveraging myself there. I mean, so I'm, I'm, 
I'm leveraging my uh, credibility slightly excessively, I would say. Um, uh, but, you know, in such a small community, they're flattered that someone takes them mm -hmm. seriously. Uh, they're flattered that someone, you know, they're over flattered that a professional from outside probably knows more than inside, which is a bit stupid. But um, so I'm leveraging all of that, that uh, value. And, and in a way, I'm also, I feel obliged to leverage it, I suppose, because that's the other question. Why the hell would you do it? In, in a way, it's a sort of sense that if you have the potential to, to leverage your value, why, why not? I mean, well, shouldn't you do it? I mean, mm -hmm. um, and so I would say that, that we have managed. I, I don't think they, they, they think about that, and nor do I, because I don't see this as architectural or non-architectural. I would say that as architects, we are trained um, to link things together. We are trained mm -hmm. to see that the, the, um, solutions come out of the, the, the diverse potentials and that, that the potentially conflictive uh, things have to be resolved into one direction. And, and this is our talent. And I think it's interesting. I mean, that, that thing I showed you about the traffic, I'm not sure how else you would ever solve it. Mm -hmm. Because the traffic engineer, I mean, even in our contract, I mean, we're struggling now because the, the I mean, we don't have a design contract for it, but it doesn't matter because we're, we're doing this for nothing anyway. But even in the description of the works, it's going to be contracted as engineering works. And, and I'm trying to say, no, it's not engineering works. It's, it's urban works, because otherwise, if it's engineering works, the, the sidewalk material is, in, you know, is not... It's not chosen because of people walking on it or consideration of that. It's chosen because that's what you do in engineering works. So it's even in that situation, you, we still have to fight to say that the, you, that the criteria need to be adjusted because everyone stays in their own criteria box. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's... So I, I think that who... So if... if who is going to link those things together? Because every time, I mean, even in, even in an urban situation, you know, you go to a planning office and you say, you know, wouldn't it be good to get, you know, so we're designing a building and in front there's a square and we're designing the square and we're saying, but wouldn't it be good to get the traffic? Why, is, why do we have traffic in the square? We could get rid of the traffic. And the planner said, yeah, absolutely. That would be a great idea. So, okay, so why don't we talk to the planning, to the traffic? So we talked to the planning and they said, it's a great idea. Why don't we talk to the traffic? And say, no, no, I would don't talk to the traffic. I mean, it's, they absolutely they will never agree. But they're in the same department as you. Yeah, but they they don't have any interest in what we do. And then you're talking about trees. And then you say, well, that's the landscape department. I mean, we're talking about the same city administration, and they won't. The three departments won't talk to each other. Because the, tree, the, the landscape people are only interested in maintenance of the trees. The traffic people are only interested in the, you know, keeping their traffic. And the, and the planners are interested in that. That would never happen here. <laughs> Absolutely it does. And, and it's only if you can see the other side of the... You, know, you can see why you might shift your criteria. And I would say that that's what happened on the noise museum, that you know, everybody wanted something different. And I just put them all in the same room and I said, okay, let's all, you know, we as a team, we just, we, we tried to um, have the confrontations as being a sort of collective intelligence instead of a, uh, you know, a collective confrontation. I'll just ask you one more question, and Gordon. You, you, you said an interesting thing. You, you deconstructed what you were really trying to do from going from ugly buildings to... Um, revit revitalizing the economy, getting the traffic, to really you wanted to stop young people leaving. And, and then you said, uh, you thought uh, one of the reasons behind Brexit was people were unhappy with their living space. And I dare say that parts of Galicia and parts of the pro-Brexit uh, voting zones in the UK probably look kind of similar, i.e. not great. I, I prefer to be in Galicia than in parts of northern England. I mean, I, I, there are some towns in the north of England which are, you know, we've just neglected. We haven't, we haven't um, invested in them. We haven't looked after uh, infrastructure. We haven't looked after basic services. 
um, you, you know, we've neglected. And, and uh, we just haven't taken care. And, and therefore, you know, if you wake up in the morning and that's, that's where you live, if other things are, if everything else is going right, then maybe it's okay. Um, but if it's not, I would say that, that that's a contributing factor. And I think that, um, you know, as an architect, I, I, I would say it, wouldn't I? But I do believe that the physical um, uh, environment is, is part of your identity. And, and the strange thing is, um, we don't quite know what the whole thing is about, but clearly there is, there is social discontent there. And, and I would say, and it, of course, it's much easier if you're in Galicia and you've got a view of the sea and it's, there's a forest and, you know, even if the middle of the town is a bit ugly, it's still, you know, it's still pretty pleasant. If you're in the middle of a city and, it's, and you don't have a good situation, that's a very different thing. So, um, you know, we have to compensate for that. And I don't think uh, uh, endless consumption of, of uh, stuff is, is a compensation. And I, and I think we won't be able to, you know, we can't keep consuming. And therefore, I think um, thinking about uh, a more uh, collective, I mean, this is the thing I like about that region and Spain in general. I would say there's, while uh, there are other problems that Spain has, I think that the idea of the, um, the sort of societal structure um, you know, no other country would have survived with the unemployment levels that they had mm. over the last uh, 10 or 15 years. You know, we had 65% unemployment of 20, under 28-year-olds. I mean, that's unsustainable, except they managed to do it because um, of the family structure and the social structure. And, mm. and that's something to, to teach us uh, in the North. Let's get some questions from the audience. And this lady here had her hand up. From the very beginning. Can you wait for the microphone? It's coming from right behind you. Thank you. I was just wondering when you uh, did the new uh, plan for the street, whether you considered bike paths. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's absolutely right. We're, we're thinking more of that. We're also thinking about um, uh, public transport because one of the problems about um, rural communities uh, is that a lot of people, you know, a lot of young kids, you know, if you're 14 or 15, you depend on your mother or your father to drive you somewhere. So we're working with um, car companies who are already working on, on driverless buses and things like that. But I don't think we even need driverless. But minibus systems, which could actually work on a matrix instead of routes, um, would be a very interesting way of um, dealing with that centralized parking and and minibus systems are, are something. So that's the other. That's another thing we're doing is bringing people in from from outside. We're working with a forestry. I'm sorry, changing subject from traffic, but the same. You know, we are bringing um, companies and expertise from outside. So in in this idea of mobility, all car companies are looking towards the death of the car and the importance of public transport or, you know, in a way, shared and common uh, transportation. And I think that that is something that needs to be applied to the rural areas, and that's something we're, we're working with. Um, and then we're bringing other uh, groups in. We're trying to work with a uh, technical university in, in Munich, where they have an applied um, sciences university, very famous, working on forestry, land management, and, and, and farming and we're trying to get them to team up with um, the Galician government to uh, instigate universities there to train young people not to pick potatoes but to, to work in that sector and forestry especially we have 70% of forestry and we're getting a Swiss company who's advising the uh, Ministry of Forestry on how they can manage their forests and get more leverage more value out of wood production, things like that. I mean, so these things are, I mean, they, the, once you start, it's, it's quite interesting where it potentially can go. The gentleman right behind, and then we'll go back to this gentleman. Um, good evening. Um, if I start with St. Ives, St. Ives, Ives has a problem that there's too many holiday homes, yeah. 
and they're trying to stop it, as you know. Right, now, when you've cleaned up that little village and you've done that lovely road, fantastic. The next thing that happen will be gentrification. I mean, the people from Santiago de Compostela will buy a holiday home. They will store those old homes as weekend homes um, or people coming in from England on the summer holiday like you and then they go back again. And so the revitalization leads to a gentrification, which is a typical development, which is a problem, of course. Mm. The other thing is I, live, I, have an old, I have a place in an old town in Italy which is totally protected and let, listed so it's not falling to pieces. But the old homes are very small and very dark and they don't have natural gas supply because it doesn't work in there. So people from the old town, which is it, are all moving to the new town where they've got nice houses, big terraces, fresh air. Uh, which In the old town it's very hot in those houses in summer. So that's another question I have that you say revitalizing, revitalizing the town with inhabitants, but those small houses you show which are dilapidated, um, even if they're restored, they have small rooms and it's very hot if the sun hits them. And that's why they build high-rise, where you have a lovely view of the sea, and there's fresh air and a breeze, and you probably have large rooms, central heating, and all that stuff. So, I mean, you know, the logic behind he it is, is, those big blocks. is ugly, is ugly, but there is a logic in these high-rise. I, I wouldn't say it's a, there's, plen there's plenty of air in Galicia. It's the Atlantic coast. There's more air than you ever want. But you, the serious, I mean, thank you for asking about tourism, because that's a really interesting thing. One of the problems is that if you let local uh, and traditional economies collapse, then they get replaced by tourism. And that's something that we are absolutely um, committed to, is that you've got to make sure that tourism doesn't fill a void that's left when young people have nothing to do. So it's absolutely critical you go the other way around. And very interesting, I think we're at the curve, a point in the curve now where... Um, the effects of tourism are well understood. So the mayor of Santiago, I mean, who's actually um, also uh, involved in this with us, we're, you know, he's also contributed to our project, um, luckily from the Green Party. Um, he, he, we had the first meeting we had with him, I wasn't quite sure what his position was. He said, oh, you know, we have a real problem of tourism. And I thought, oh, not another one that thinks... Because Galicia has always been waiting for tourism. They thought that they, they could just, just wait till the tourists come and then they're safe and they can build... And, and they would do it tomorrow if they could and they would build big hotels in there. Um, and he said, no, we have too much tourism in Santiago. Uh, and they don't. Uh, and actually, it's a rather nice... I mean, they're all religious pilgrims or, you know, everybody coming to Santiago is, is a rather nice type of tourism. Um, but they're already aware that they have to um, control this. Uh, and I think, so I think there is a growing understanding of the devastation that, that tourism does. And I, and I think you're, you're absolutely crucial. But you can't stop tourism. But what you can do is to make sure that the, the community has a um, still vitality. Because tourism goes when everybody else is evacuated. Gentleman there with his hand up. I'd be very curious to find out a little bit more about the foundation. How many people actually work there? It sounds like you spend all your time in Galicia <laughs> <laughs> advising. How do you um, put your agenda together? I mean, who actually decides on what areas to focus on, what questions to ask, what surveys to do? How many people work for you or with you? And how do you finance the whole thing? And the other question I would have after that is um, whether you the experiences that you're making are applicable, or obviously they are applicable to other areas in Europe, but whether there is any interchange with other parts of the European Union with similar um, questions, and whether you're putting together something like a manifesto or <laughs> gathering your experiences for um, recommendations in other parts of Europe. No, absolutely. I mean, we, are, we are collaborating, and we're trying to bring people in. And interestingly, European funding always enjoys that. It's much, you've got much more chance of getting funding if you can collaborate with other European uh, partners. They're, slightly do they're, they're sort of worried if someone's doing something somewhere and they ask for funding, um, you know, are they going to use it in the right way? If you're tied into three other organizations, maybe that. So absolutely we're, we're, we're looking. And of course, as I keep saying, in a way, I'm drawn to this thing uh, in a sort of immediate manner. 
because it's right on my doorstep and it's there. But I'm also drawn because I, I think it had, you know, I'm, the reason I, it, it sustains me or I keep at it is because of the other issues, that, that, which are more generally applicable. And the idea that I think that um, it can, it, we have a sort of laboratory condition um, to try to prove uh, that connecting decision making together. Um, you know, in London, connected decisions only ever happen if we have the Olympics. You know, if we have the Olympics, then all of a sudden, everybody gets off their, their planning bums and starts to say, well, we can do this and we can do that. Because there's an urgency, there's a focus. Um, there's no, you know, otherwise things are not focused. To bring people together to, to make coordinated decisions normally is quite difficult. So if we can show in this much more benign and innocent environment that if you can get people from the, from the uh, scientific community and, and when you say, you know, what programs do, they're starting to come to us. Um, the University of Vigo, the marine biology department, now we've known them for three or four years, you know, they are coming to us and, and um, starting to ask us whether we could help them um, with certain programs. Uh, five people. And, and, and at the beginning, the architects are terrible because if you, if you um, sit young architects down and say, don't design, just do analysis and diagnosis and look at things, and, and then you come back and, you know, a month later they've, they've drawn fantasy, <laughs> piers into the water and hotels on stilts and <laughs> all sorts of stupid things. Um, and this team is not at all. They're fantastic. And I think one of the things that's... Ha why, why this whole thing is possible is because of the Spanish recession. What happened is that, you know, Spain has had such a, a bad recession. Before the recession, everybody believed that development, uh, land development, touristic development, all of those things would rescue every, every area. Now what's happened is a new reality that, that set in is... Um, take a look, because this is what it is. No fairy godmother is going to come and say they want to build a block of apartments or no Hong Kong investor is going to come and, and uh, build a shopping mall and no government is going to come. And, uh, so you've got to make it out of the sticks and stones you've got here. You can't... And actually, it's quite good because you don't start fantasizing about it. If only this happened or if only that happened. So actually, my, you know, my team, who, poor things, you know, they trained seven years to, to design buildings, <laughs> are working on sidewalks and, and uh, things like that. But I have to say, it's, I, they, they're like me. I mean, I think there's a sort of sense that the, the idea is, is quite rewarding. And... Uh, it's a sort of antidote to, to um, typical architectural practice where we're struggling the other way, which is to sort of say, um, you know, we're here. Um, can't you use us more for more valuable things than just uh, um, expensive apartment buildings and leveraging value of land? And of course, you know, that's... That's a, that's, that's a bigger issue about, you know, who is going to pay for housing, who's going to pay for school. I mean, in England, we don't have social housing because there's no money to be made in it. How do you make money in social housing? Well, you don't. We don't build schools because there's no... So the Anglo-Saxon thing has been that, that you know, architecture is, architects are more employed by the sector that produces money than the sector that produces value. Uh, so it's only quantifiable value, and I think societal values. So, I mean, we even had a minister of, of, um, of education, the, the dastardly um, Michael Gove, who was one of the foremost Brexiteers, typical, um, who, while he was minister of education, said, we do not want architects to design schools. We don't want architects making money out of schools. Um, so... That's a sort of, you know, that's, that's where you've got to in, in uh, I mean, we're way ahead of the rest of Europe in this. And we're 
about to go even further. <laughs> Let's finish one more question. Um, anyone has a question? You've silenced them. Yes, we have here. Dan, Dan, you get the last word. Uh, I'm just curious about... Clearly, one area for advocacy was to persuade the political leadership that this is worth doing. But you said throughout in your remarks that one of the challenges is that the citizens, the community members, didn't think of themselves as living an oppressed life. And therefore, I guess my question is, as you tried to take them through this and advocate for why this change is meaningful, how did they respond? Is the community behind this? Yeah, totally. And, and I think because we're taking them, you know, because they're small things. Funny enough, of course, people... Uh, that people don't trust you when you say you're going to do something enormous. But if you say you're going to um, close a car park because it's in front of the sea, they, they, they rather like that. I mean, things which affect them directly. And, and I would say that's what I started from. You know, everybody there lives somehow from the land or from the water. Um, and so, therefore, it's not so difficult to get them to buy into those issues. But you do have to make the issues bigger. So, for instance, the mayors, I mean, we, we, we've been advocating to protect the water quality because if, if you let that go, everything goes, you know, because you, you can easily, you know, the, the quality of this, the clams and things absolutely dependent on the water quality. But there's so many people invested with that that you don't have to persuade them. However, there's a lot of, it's still a, a big uh, gap between everybody behaving responsibly, responsibly. So we all know the plastic, throwing them in, whatever. So, for instance, one, I mean, talking about this idea of, of making things bigger, the local mayors are saying, yeah, you know, we, we have sewage treatment, the, 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 that's all in place, and therefore the water quality shouldn't be going down, but they find it difficult to persuade everybody to link into it. So what they like is the idea that we're actually raising this, the profile of this story um, so they don't have to knock on people's doors to say, you know, have you linked into that? It's we sort of spreading the sort of guilt uh, amongst everybody to say that protecting the water is fundamental to the community. And therefore, it a, it's a, it's becomes, in a way, a slightly overstated um, question, but it's something they will buy into. I mean, and I think, I mean, there is... I would say it's it's very impressive that they are, you know, they haven't rejected us and, and run us out of town. Um, but we do work very hard. We have lots of workshops and we have, you know, always open houses and, and, and um, uh, the team is totally, you know, um, part of the community. You have to. You, you've got to bring everybody along with you, including everybody that's going to complain about driving 30 kilometres an hour instead of 50. Well, David, thank you so much for talking about you. I hope your project in Galicia goes well. I hope it does become a test case for a broader dialogue about planning and decision-making. Um, and thank you so much for a wonderful talk tonight. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>